In this manner, our researchers on military duty continued their obstacle course, one trouble after another, for almost 10 years, until Deputy Defense Minister General Per Hotkin signed an order that put an end to their hardships, and they finally got the opportunity to establish their own research unit, which was soon equipped with a proper testing facility. It was the first lab in the Military Medical Academy that was established by the order of the USSR State Committee on Science and Research. It was 1983, and military involvement with Afghanistan was ongoing, as was the nuclear standoff in deep sea waters. And this was a weapon too. We developed six new preparations in the shortest possible time. Today, all of them are available on the market, and they are widely used in medical practice. More than 15 million people have benefited from our developments over the last 20 years. In many cases, the drugs proved to be very effective. But what's more, there was not a single case of negative side effects or any allergies. These are safe medications, because they employ the mechanisms of nature itself. By the mid-80s, Morozov and Kavinson had been able to learn more about the role peptides played in molecular synthesis. They also developed a research network and established cooperation with some of the country's best research centers that helped in developing the synthetic analogues of peptides of animal origin. We started breaking up this compound in our lab at the Bioorganic Chemistry Institute. We defined its active agents and then we just got stuck. We couldn't move on, as we didn't know what was in it. They just gave us a tiny amount of the substance and asked us to solve its structure. The staff of the Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Laboratory succeeded in identifying the spatial and chemical structure of the thymic peptide molecule. It was an easy and routine task for us. We took a sample, examined it, identified the formula and reported the result. This allowed us to manufacture the preparation by means of chemical synthesis as opposed to extracting it from animals. It was a major breakthrough when researchers succeeded in producing short peptides with predefined properties which were close to the organic ones. Thanks to this, mass production of new preparations, called peptide bioregulators, was launched in the Soviet Union. The laboratory was distinguished with government awards, the authors received further promotion and scientific degrees, as well as the green light for further research. All the developed preparations were protected with domestic and international patents. By and large, just two types of molecules maintain our life. Proteins or peptides that carry the information and the DNA that carries its specific information too. The DNA is, however, just a matrix. It is a molecule that by itself performs no function. Only when a relevant peptide connects with the corresponding segment of the DNA will it trigger off the synthesis of specific proteins. And that's the key to life. Basically, it comes down to the very question of how life came into being on our planet. And from what we saw, it was this way. In other words, we managed to replicate nature itself. In April 1986, nuclear disaster hit Chernobyl, Ukraine. 200,000 people were evacuated from the contaminated area. Over 600,000 people took part in the work to contain the contamination. Many of these people were exposed to high radiation levels. Both military and civil medical services were struggling to help the victims. Peptide preparations were administered in high doses and helped dramatically reduce the mortality rate. This actually got lower than the average mortality rate across the country at the time. The experts explain this by the fact that providing the best quality health care to those involved was the top priority at the time. It was much better and efficient medical care than the rest of the country was receiving on a routine basis. In April 1989, another nuclear disaster occurred in the Norwegian Sea. A fire broke out on board the nuclear submarine Komsomolets, which subsequently sank. The disaster took the lives of 42 crew members out of 69 due to fire and prolonged exposure to low temperatures in ice-cold water. Even today, no one can really explain how crew members managed to survive a full 90 minutes in the ice-cold water. 
Fifteen minutes is the established survival limit for the Barents Sea. The 27 surviving submariners were treated in the Northern Fleet Naval Medical Center. The treatment was a success. The submariners fully recovered and were able to return to military duty. Their treatment program also included peptide preparations invented by Vyacheslav Marazov and Vladimir Kavinson. Along with the other medical staff, they received a new promotion as a reward for this achievement. Marozov and Kavinson were promoted to colonels of the USSR medical force. The laboratory also received an achievement award. In 1991, the operation of the laboratory of peptide bioregulators was discontinued. The state lifted its protection from the laboratory's patents. The army contracts were discontinued. The employees lost their jobs. The researchers, who achieved a major breakthrough, found themselves in the streets. Military medicine began to break up. Vladimir Kavinson was under pressure. It was the end, basically. The lab was dismantled. They were left on their own to find an answer to the question, who would now be interested in their past achievements? The answer was given by life itself. In Russia, from 1992 to 2004, 11 million premature deaths in men and 4 million premature deaths in women were registered in the 15 to 69 age group. These were people who had failed to adjust to the shockingly new order of life they suddenly faced. The entire population was exposed to continuous high stress. People were scared for the lives of their loved ones. Premature aging syndrome was no longer the curse of submarine crews. It now hit Russia's entire population. The new task that Vyacheslav Marozov and Vladimir Kavinson, no longer holders of military ranks, set for themselves, was to find a way to extend the lifespan of people experiencing aging, whether premature or timely. By 1992, they had succeeded in establishing the Institute for Bioregulation and Gerontology in St. Petersburg and transferred all the copyright for over 100 of this that They managed to procure financial support to enable them to continue paying patent fees. This is how all their know-how got to stay in Russia. The scope of peptide research continued to grow. Marozov and Kavinson invited new researchers and contracted new facilities to work on their project, which benefited from fresh minds and state-of-the-art equipment. A lot of our research was dedicated to studying infections in primates. As monkeys are unique test subjects in that they can develop practically all the infectious conditions that occur in humans. In some cases, they are the only possible test subjects because only primates and humans are sensitive to certain bacteria and viruses. To create a model of these diseases is possible only with monkeys. With them, vaccines can be tested against these infectious agents. For example, the eradication of polio, poliomyelitis, as an epidemic disease is largely thanks to the fact that monkeys were used in the experiments. They claim these peptides were capable of restoring the functions of every organ and endocrine gland which would be a totally outstanding achievement. Thus, it made me on the one hand quite skeptical, but on the other, it tempted me to try and see for myself how these agents would work in primates, my research subjects. Rhesus monkeys, just like humans, have endogenous circadian rhythm cycles and their pineal glands produce melatonin at night, just like that of humans.
So we set a task for ourselves to check the efficiency of pineal peptides such as epitalon. Epitalon is a synthetic tetrapeptide that was obtained by the Institute of Bioregulation and Gerontology. It was reported to stimulate production of melatonin by the pineal gland in both young and old rats alike. But this didn't really make much sense to me because it seemed to be at odds with biological necessity. Why would both young and old test subjects develop similar levels of melatonin? We presume that the same test would have to yield different results in such highly organized animals as monkeys, who, unlike rats, have the same daily rhythm cycle as humans. In 2000, a four-month test was run on two sets of animal groups, young and old. The dose of 10 micrograms of epitalon was administered daily to subjects in the treatment groups and a placebo to animals in the control groups. 10 micrograms is a very small amount, which means it's highly tolerable. Usually, a single dose of a medicinal preparation is several milligrams or grams. At the end of the test, blood samples were taken to check melatonin levels. We compared melatonin levels in blood of all four animal groups and saw that the administered epitalon increased night melatonin levels in old subjects. At the same time, it brought about no change in melatonin levels in younger animals. It appeared that melatonin levels in old animals increased to match the levels that are normal in young monkeys. That prompted the conclusion that pineal cells of young monkeys which were functioning normally simply ignored the administered peptides as they were not needed. This meant that peptides do their work only when necessary. It was another breakthrough which gave impetus to further research. Our new task was to find out whether epitalon could ensure protection of the nervous, cardiovascular and hematopoietic systems against continuous exposure to stress and premature aging in humans. Application of epitalon triggers off a chain of recovery processes which restore the normal functioning of all body systems. It's essential to achieve recovery of the higher regulatory systems first, as they'll then be able to take care of everything else. It would be safe to say that we may expect new preparations to be produced in the near future, which would help older people deal with their cardiovascular conditions, improve their cerebral circulation and relieve other ailments caused by aging. The positive regulatory effect of the preparations was confirmed. The old animals enhanced their capacity to withstand continuous stress. Their immune system was boosted, their coat became healthy and shiny, and the animals looked better and developed more active behavior patterns. The computer age that started in the 1990s brought science and research to a dramatically new level. Computers could process large bulks of data in mere seconds. And since they had become universally available, development moved on in giant steps. 3D modeling was born. People not involved in scientific research are familiar with 3D movies. Long extinct dinosaurs came alive and practically jumped off the screen. And 3D representations of Hollywood stars set out on endless quests in computer games. In terms of scientific progress, however, the possibility to model any complex live or mechanical system became paramount in that it finally supplied the ultimate validity test for the ideas developed back in the 70s. All advanced industries and scientific research, including air and space exploration and chemistry and biology, switched to 3D design technologies. It saved a huge amount of money thanks to the fact that much testing was now run on mathematical models as opposed to real prototypes. Mathematical model is a description of a system, object or process using mathematical concepts and language. Mathematical models use mathematical notions to describe the main parameters of the modeled object, process or system.
So nano projects got their chance to be tested and developed further. Drexler and Freitas introduced the world to the technical wonders of nano robotics, and biology scientists from all over the world proceeded to work on the global protein data bank project. Designing a mathematical model of a molecule would replicate its actual spatial configuration and takes into account both the energy levels of all the comprising atoms and the molecule's motion trajectory in the medium was now the researcher's dream come true. The rate of knowledge exchange soared. Supercomputer centers used in the past to do calculations for nuclear and space projects were now used to explore the depths of the human body. It should be noted that it was researchers at the Institute of Bioorganic Chemistry who were the first ever to identify the structure of a live protein molecule. It happened in 1983, and up to now, the Institute remains one of the world's leading research hubs. The research to identify a protein structure is conducted on one half a milliliter of the solution containing that protein. That tiny amount contains 10 to the power of 17 protein molecules. Furthermore, each molecule comprises some 20,000 atoms. Can you imagine it? And now, what we do is we look at a pair of adjacent atoms and measure the distance between them. We do this for all the atoms in the molecule, and after we're done measuring all these distances, alongside with lots of other parameters, we can produce a model of the molecule's structure, where we have pinpointed all the position measurements for all atoms. We can also capture movement patterns of all atoms in that molecule, and produce relevant amplitude and frequency measurements, thus building a physical model of the protein's function patterns. All the obtained data describing the processes that occur in a molecule are submitted for processing to the Mathematical Modeling Laboratory. We have researched the properties of large systems, including some supramolecular systems such as proteins of biological membranes. These are very complex systems which consist of hundreds of thousands of atoms. We developed tentative behavioral models for these systems and ran experiments which proved the accuracy of the mathematical models we came up with. The key thing is that the model's processing must be relevant. One shouldn't expect a mathematical model to give readings it wasn't designed for or fine-tuned to produce. Roughly speaking, everything we can do today with the help of nuclear magnetic resonance is like a modern movie compared to early daguerreotype prints. And watching this movie gives us a much better understanding of how it all works, helping in our efforts to develop a drug that will repair the wrong moves this or that protein makes, fixing their function. <laughs>